Today's guest and first guest is William Spurgeon. So good afternoon, William. How are you today? Good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So I've had the chance over the last uh, couple of years to be able to interact with you and many of your other uh, SOG friends. And so thank you for taking your time today for doing this. Sure. Pleasure. And, uh, you know, it was nice to be able to talk to you off camera last week. So now we have a bit of a base about um, what to talk about, you know, and there's so many interesting things in your life. Um, so I, I had asked you in the beginning, um, was your dad a veteran? Because, you know, I'm sure that many World War II veterans inspired their children to go and serve. And you said that, no, uh, that your dad didn't. He was too young to go into World War I and too old for World War II. Um, but then you also um, have, or uh, is he still with us, your your, your brother? Uh, no. Okay, so sorry to hear that. Um, but your brother served as a Marine in the Korean War. So did he inspire you to join up or what made you? I, I, I guess he did in a, in a way. Uh, I, I just felt sort of obligated to carry on, you know, the family tradition. And the, the Vietnam War was starting to get cranked up there in the mid 60s. And uh, I had finished high school and uh, I started college, dropped out because I didn't really want to go. All my friends were going, but I just really didn't want to go. And so uh, I started working as a welder, uh, building horse trailers. And uh, I spent all my money on uh, an old hot rod. And uh, so I did some racing on the weekends and some street racing <laughs> during the week. Uh, and after a couple of years, I, I decided I was really going nowhere with my life. And uh, this was in 65. And uh, the war was really starting to get cranked up. So I started considering uh, joining the military at, at about that time. And so when you were just because, I mean, I like fast cars, too. So back in the day, for many of us who are uh, were born in the 70s, we watched uh you know, a lot of the hot rod movies. Um, and so did you race for like pink slips or money or girls or what, <laughs> what was it? Usually, uh, you know, on, on the weekends at the drag strip, you raced for a trophy. That that was it. But on the street, it was just racing, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, during this time, they were building uh, Loop 820 around Fort Worth, where I was born and raised there. Right. So there were miles and miles of, of this interstate uh, that wasn't open. So it made a perfect drag strip, uh, you know, during the week. So we'd go out there, 25, 30 cars you wow. know, race on a closed interstate. So, yeah. And the police the, didn't mind that or they turned a blind eye or I mean, like today, you can't do that at all, right? Oh, I think they had rather us be uh, racing on that uh, closed interstate than uh, down the street, you know. But they, they knew we were kids, we were going to race somewhere. So I think they just tolerated it. So you had your fun. And I know that you had told me that uh, you did have an interaction with a policeman about your speed. And that gave you that kick in the rear to make your choice. Either I can be a... Uh, a street racer or I can, I can do something. So was that, was that when you made your mind up? What happened? I, uh, I was racing, uh, on a highway. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, got clocked at doing about a hundred miles an hour. So the, uh, the ticket was for drag racing and speeding, reckless driving, all, you know, all wow. above. So it was, uh, quite a bit of money. And I decided, uh, well, now's a good time for me to go ahead and join the Army, and I'll just leave them with that ticket. But uh, I, I went ahead and signed up, you know, did all the physical EM process and everything, and, and this was in Fort Worth. And so uh, the day I was supposed to ship, I had to go over to Dallas. And that's where the MEP station was. And uh, we went in there and in process, and we were waiting uh, to be sworn in, and, and the sergeant, came out and he said, who's Spurgeon? I said, I am. He said, I need to talk to you. Oh. 
took me in there and he said, uh, you got a speeding ticket uh, you hadn't paid? I said, yeah. And uh, he said, uh, well, you got to clear that up before you can ship. Oh, and wow. I said, well, let me, I said, what if I uh, call my parents and get them to go pay the thing? Can I still ship today? And he said, yeah. So I went outside, walked across the street. There was a pay phone there. And uh, so I called my mom and I said, I need you to go pay this ticket. And she said, okay, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. And it, interestingly, I hung up the phone. I turned around. There was a cop standing there. Oh. He said, uh, young man, he said, do you know that jaywalking is illegal in Dallas, Texas? I, I said, I, I didn't know, I guess. And he said, well, it is. And he wrote me a ticket for jaywalking. Oh. I walked across from the MEP station to the phone. And so I took the ticket and I went back in the MEP station and I said, you know what? I ain't paying no jaywalking ticket. <laughs> so I still owe Dallas County $3 for jaywalking. But I went back in and uh, got it squared away and I shipped out to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana for basic training that night. And so after you did your, your uh, basic, I mean, how did you, um, what made you, uh, aspire to be special forces was it something on tv did you see or or you know did you what what made you join the special forces you know i i didn't even know what it was uh i knew when i went to the army i wanted to do something special something i didn't want to be just an average grunt right so i'd seen some some old uh world war ii movies on the big picture on television and uh, I remembered the 101st Airborne. And so I knew that had to be a good unit, you know. And so I joined the Army Airborne Unassigned, which meant I was going to be airborne, but uh, I didn't sign up for any particular MOS or skill. Okay. Or so uh, uh, in basic, uh, they called a group of us in one day and said, oh, you guys are eligible to go to officer candidate school if you want to apply for it. And I thought, well, that, that might be okay. So I put in an application for OCS. And uh, after I finished basic, I went out to Fort Ord, California for advanced infantry training, AIT. And while I was there, uh, a couple of weeks, a guy come around and, and uh well, it was the company commander. He called us in. It was about six or eight of us. And he said, uh, you guys are, are, by your scores, eligible to apply for Rotary Wing Flight School. Hmm. And uh, I thought, well, that'd be pretty cool, flying helicopters, you know. And uh, I said, well, I already got an application in for OCS. He said, well, if you apply for uh, flight school, that'll, that'll nullify the OCS. So I decided to apply for flight school. And, uh, of course, there was a lot to that. You had to take a test. You had to pass the eye exam, do an orientation flight, several things like that. And uh, so I was going through that process, and I finished all that in, in the next couple, three weeks. And right near the end of AIT, uh, a guy come in. He was wearing jungle fatigues, and uh, uh, he got about six of us off one day after formation, and he said, you guys are uh, eligible uh, for special forces training. He said, I tell by looking at you, none of you would make it, but uh, I have to tell you, if you want to apply, you can. And I thought, wow, <laughs> just laid the gauntlet down, you know? And uh, so I went ahead and applied for special forces just on a fluke. And uh, interestingly, when uh, the day before graduation from AIT, the company commander called me in. He said, Spurgeon, you got to go down to the airborne procurement office and sign a waiver. Otherwise, you're shipping out of here to jump school tomorrow. So, you know, dumb private. I, I got on a bus and went to main post and found the airborne procurement office and it was closed. So uh, the next day I shipped out to Fort Bend into jump school. And uh, uh, the next week, about three guys from my company at Fort Ord showed up at jump school. They had also been waiting orders for this flight school. And uh, they told me that that flight school had been canceled or that class had been canceled and they were, they shipped them on out to uh, Fort Benning for jump school. 
And I said, well, I guess I made the right decision because, you know, I wouldn't have been to flight school anyway. The thing was canceled. And and uh, my third week in jump school, in jump week, uh, I got a set of orders to report to Fort Bragg for special forces training. So that's what I did. So at this point in time, you know, there's a question that I over the podcast that I've watched is nobody really talks about um, not boot camp because boot camp seems to be the same across the board. But how, did you, how did you did you when you went into the military, were you into sports? Did you go were you physically active? And so my question to you is. Did you find boot camp was um, walk in the park? Was it easy? And then when you join special forces, you have to do a, another, I would imagine, other things to prove yourself physically? Yeah, I, I thought basically it was kind of tough. Uh, I started, you know, I, I joined on the 13th of September, so it was hot at Fort Polk. So it was, it was you know, challenging. And I was in an airborne company. Everybody in that company had signed up for Airborne. So we ran everywhere we went. And it was so physically, it was pretty challenging. But when I got to Fort Ord, uh, interestingly enough, they had a uh, meningitis outbreak on post there. And uh, they wouldn't allow us to run anywhere or march very far. So uh, we were trucked or bussed out to all the ranges and everything. So uh, I, I really got out of shape uh right. during AIT but when I got to jump school by then it was really cold at Fort Benning and and uh we did PT I was stripped down to skins you know no shirts just and we ran in jump boots or jump in uh, boots combat boots at the time uh but it was really cold uh so I guess that would be about it yeah, I mean, uh, I never served, and uh, but there was probably a point as far as physical fitness when I was 16 that I was, uh, you know, boxing, going to the gym, and I was trying to be a, a, a lifeguard, and the lifeguard uh, training was too much, and every time I went there, I like, you know, threw up. It was just, just too much physicality yeah. to do those three, but definitely um, with the other two, that was probably the fittest that I've ever been. And like, I think people forget that, you know, like you just uh, added some clarity that, that when you went to uh, the, the second part of your training, you were not out of shape, but you, to be in that car, like if you stop doing cardio, it, it's a, it's a difficult thing to get your cardio back. Right. Yeah. You know, so because of that, jump school was kind of challenging physically. But uh, when I got to Fort Bragg, uh, the Special Forces training in those days had three phases. And phase one was pretty much just uh, small unit tactics, patrolling, field craft, that kind of stuff. Phase two was when you went to your actual MOS training, whatever your specialty was going to be. And then phase three was this giant field problem, uh, FTX. And so uh, phase one was out at Camp McCall there at Fort Bragg. And and uh, it, it was physically challenging. Uh, very little sleep, go, 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 you know, constantly uh, doing land navigation or, or some field craft out there and patrolling. But when we got to phase two, it was totally different. We we had daily PT just, you know, for half hour, 45 minutes. But phase two was really academic. I mean, we went to class all day and we studied all night. It was it was very challenging academically. Right. And then uh, phase three, of course, then that was a, a, a mostly a field problem, a, a unconventional warfare FTX. And uh, so it was physically challenging. Uh but uh, special forces training today is is a lot more physically challenging than it was in our day. In, in the in the nineteen sixty six, uh, they were really building up a group in Vietnam. They were opening up a camps all over the place, and there was a big push to get some people over there. In fact, the class I went to was the first class they allowed privates 
uh, to go through SF training. Prior to that, you had to be a buck sergeant to go through the training. And wow. because they needed people so bad, they opened it up to the lower ranking people uh, to go to the training. So now at this point in your training, you're obviously seeing some um, Vietnam veterans coming back and, and like teaching you about what you might encounter. And did you hear, like, does, did that encourage you and excite you to hear those stories of the, the veterans coming back and, you know, that kind of thing? Well, it, it did. And, and in fact, when I finished training group, I was assigned to a company of the six special forces group there at Fort Bragg. So the day I signed in, uh, I went to the orderly room, signed in, and I asked the clerk, I said, I'd like a uh, 1049, which is a request for reassignment. I said, I want a 1049 for Vietnam. And uh, he said, you can't go to Vietnam until you make E5, Buck Sergeant. And I didn't believe him. I, I said, yeah, I, I said, you mean I can't volunteer to go to Vietnam? I joined the Army to go to Vietnam. <laughs> he said, no. I said, well, I'd like to fill that paperwork out anyway. He said, okay. So I feel about a 1049 for Vietnam and uh, never never heard anything back on it. So uh, I was hanging out there at Fort Bragg. We were doing, you know, a bunch of post support and stuff. And, and uh, uh, we went on a, a, a 30 day field training problem. And my job, I was I was assigned to this master sergeant, a guy named Hanselman who had been one of the original SF guys back in 1952. And our mission was to, to be a target for these teams to recon. And so for 30 days, we sat out in the woods, uh, keeping a fire going and just talking. And it was probably the best training I had in, in all of my career, because I sat there for 30 days and just picked his brain, you know, and uh, he taught me a lot of stuff. But one thing he taught me was that, you know, in the military, you really can control your own destiny if you stay ahead of the game. And he said, you, you've got to be bold and you've got to go after something. He said, there's an assignment that you want. You've got to go after it. And he said, if you just sit back and wait, Uncle Sam will give you some orders somewhere. But that's how guys end up with assignments they don't like uh, or don't want. Uh, so I learned that lesson, and uh, uh, not long after that, uh, a sergeant major came by the unit one day. He was from Thailand, and uh, when when the when the SF troops first went to Thailand, it was in the summer of 1966. Uh, it was called Delta Company of the First Group. It wasn't the 46th. It was D Company of the First Group. And they sent a company over there in three increments. So they trained and, and prepped one B team at a time to go over. And so this sergeant major that was there that day was recruiting replacements for the original D company of the first because they were nearing the end of their one year tour. And uh, when D company first went over, you had to be a combat vet to be able to be eligible to go. And so I asked the sergeant major, I said, you have to be a combat vet? And he said, no. He said, we've waived that requirement. And he said, anybody can apply for it. So, man, it sounded like they were doing some really high-speed stuff over there. And I, I thought, man, that's for me, you know. So I put in another 1049 for Vietnam. And everybody was just laughing. I mean, Spurs, and you're not going to Thailand, man. You know, it ain't going to happen. And uh, so I waited, waited, and, and the orders came down for the first increment. I wasn't on it. I said, man. So uh, I remembered what Sergeant Heinzelman had told me out in the field. He said, you got to go for it if there's something you want, you know. So <laughs> we went on a little field problem, and we came back. We had a three-day pass. And uh, I, I got my starch khakis and spit shine jump boots. And uh, I got a ride out to uh, Highway I-95 there in Fayetteville, and I hitchhiked to Washington, D.C. And uh, I spent the night in the bus station. I got up the next morning, put on my khakis, and 
in uh, my Green Beret. Uh, they had just come out with a Green Beret just uh, not long after, before that. And anyway, I went over to the Pentagon to see this lady called Miss Alexander. She was the in the special categories assignments branch, and she was the guy, the one that helped a lot of guys get assignments. And uh, it took me about two hours to find her office there. You know, it's a ramp three floor. You know, all I just took forever. Anyway, I got there, and uh, she was very nice. And and here I am, a private, and there's colonels out there carrying coffee for people. I mean, this, you know. And she said, well, how can I help you there, uh, Private Spurgeon, PFC Spurgeon? And I said, I said, I, 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 I want to go overseas. I said, I put in a request for Vietnam. I never heard anything. I put in a request for Thailand. I never, heard anything, never heard anything. She says, well, let me get your records and, and let's see what we can do. She went out my records. She came back out with a folder. Uh, and so my records had two sheets of paper in it. Oh, man. <laughs> 49 for Vietnam and a 1049 for Thailand. <laughs> so she said, well, what would you really like? I said, I'd really like to go to Thailand. I said, I, I just think they're doing some really cool stuff there. And according to that Sergeant Major, and she said, well, you go back to Fort Bragg and I'm going to send you some orders. And I went back to Bragg and sure enough, two weeks later, I had orders and I, I went to pre-mission training with the third increment and uh, went to Thailand. So, so just to interject here, and we're going to take a little bit of a step back. Your sergeant, the uh, German gentleman, was he a World War II uh, veteran? Uh, yes, he was. And, you know, when I got assigned to the sixth group at that time, uh, I would say half the people in special forces then were World War II veterans. They all spoke five, six, seven European languages. Uh, some had been in the French underground, some in the OSS. I mean, they had incredible backgrounds. Yeah. So it, it was a, uh, it was a very interesting people, a uh, group of people to, to be with at that, at that time in special forces. Yeah. Because in, in one of my books, uh, I did, I did a story on the, uh, uh, Philbin Lodge Act, and it so it enabled any foreign uh, person to join uh, the U the U.S. military if they signed up for X amount of years. So there were there were Germans, uh, there were uh, guys from France, as you said, um, you know, Belgians, and there's a whole list of them. And I was, you know, Canadians, of course, but Canadians, Canada, so close to the U.S., you would expect that a bit. But these yeah. people that they really wanted were like the German gentlemen who could speak um, German and maybe uh, an Eastern European language, uh, because obviously during the Cold War, they thought if they had to invade into Europe, they would place these special trained uh, you know, officer, uh, gentlemen to go behind enemy lines. But they had checks, I mean, from all of the European countries, they, they were in yeah. SF. Yeah. Okay, sorry to take you back there. So now we're going to take you forward. And so now you've spoken to Mrs. A, and uh, I have heard that it was very hard to find her physically with all the different corridors in the Pentagon. That's, that's funny that you mentioned that. So now it says here, yes, uh, you hitchhiked to go and see Mrs. Alexander, and then you got assigned to the 46 in Thailand. So that's where, where, where we're at at your history. Yeah, uh, I got to. I went over to Thailand in in uh, late summer of '66, and uh, when I got there, uh, my initial assignment uh, was to uh, support. Uh, they had what they called a proficiency course in Thailand, and uh, it was a in-house training for a couple of weeks where they. They uh, brought new people in and, and trained them on how to operate in the woods there, in the jungles and what have you. And uh, and so I went up in support of that pro course for a couple of weeks. And then when I came back from that, I was told that I was going to be going to this uh, hand-picked A-team uh, with a special mission. And I thought, wow, how did I get hand-picked? I mean, you know, turns out one of the guys that I had went to the – pre-mission training with uh, a guy named Willie Chong. He was a sergeant first class. 
uh, him and I became pretty good buddies during that training. And uh, that team needed a junior demo man, and I was it. So Willie recommended me, and I got picked up on this team. And so we were detached from the 46th company and and assigned to, you know, the three-letter company. Uh, and we worked for a guy named uh, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Harry Monk, who was kind Heard of a little name. part of the world, yeah. And uh, Harry the Hat, they called him. But uh, anyway, so uh, we were at a place called Huahin, which is about four hours south of Bangkok, down on the peninsula going down towards Singapore, down that way. And uh, uh, we were actually working with the Thai Border Patrol Police and the Thai Special Forces down there. And so I spent my next two years working for Harry Monk down there. Did you ever meet, um, you know, Tony Poe? He was another another agency guy. Yes, I did. He was a very, you know, I mean, from what I have been told by others, um, uh, you know, definitely enjoyed a, a sip or two of the drink during the daytime and a very colorful. I mean, the pictures I've seen of him, he was wearing like a Hawaiian shirt and, yeah. um, you know, uh, you know, some of the. I won't go into them right now because I don't want to go off on a tangent about Tony Poe, but he was definitely somebody who was living off the grid, you know, and uh, doing some, you know, questionable things. But uh, I'm sure you met some very interesting people. There was a lot of characters like that. Uh, uh, back in the day, I remember a guy named Lionel Penn, who was right? kind of a choo choo. Old... Yeah, choo choo Penn. But uh, so. We, we were training uh, mostly Thais there, Border Patrol Police and, and uh, Thai Special Forces, but about half of our training was for people, they were simply called hill tribemen. And uh, they were actually Laotians that were flown into, into Southern Thailand there, you know, under the radar. And, uh, but these were uh, troops that uh, works for the CIA camps out in Laos. So we trained a bunch of those guys while we were there. And uh, one of the big things we did was we ran a jump school and uh, it was an interesting jump school uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, just our A team was running the jump school. So we had to do all of the jobs. And so when it came uh, jump week, uh, we all uh, were jump masters. None of us, none of us young guys were jump master qualified or master parachutist or anything, but we still had the opportunity to jump master these little people. And uh, our drop zone was about, I guess, five or six kilometers from the camp uh, where we lived and worked. And, and uh, so we would go out and uh, jump with a stick, get in the Jeep, drive back, uh, shoot up again, get on the airplane, jump with another stick. We would, we would get six, seven, eight jumps a day uh, like that. So we racked up a lot of jumps over the next two years running those jump schools. And uh, the other thing that was really interesting is because we were detached from, you know, the military, the aircraft we got were all from Air America. Mm -hmm. And we never knew what plane would show up that day for jump school. Some days it was a caribou. Some days it was a DC-7. Uh, we even jumped Platys Porters, Beavers, Otters, uh, uh, CH-34s. Uh, <laughs> so it was a challenge. You never know whether to plan for a 20-man stick on a caribou or a four-man stick on a beaver, you know, but we did it. So it, uh, a question for you, sorry to cut you off there, but I think a lot of people who either haven't been in the military or know about this is that, you know, everyone has rules of engagement, I'm not talking about the enemy. So when you have, um, and I was even explaining to my parents, my uh, stepfather is like a ex, he's a you know veteran himself. Anyway, so when you're not working for the military, you're working for a different place or different uh boss yeah 
did they like i know that with the pru that when that was run by that that, that agency there there were hardly any rules so were there rules of engagement for, for you guys there was a lot of flexibility mm. <laughs> yeah and so the other question i'm sure many people would want to ask you is you were training these troops who were they fighting well uh they were they were fighting the Pathetlao in places right. there, and up in uh, northern Laos. Uh, of course, they were mixed it up with some NVA up there. Uh, so it, it was a variety of, you know, depending on where, where they were in country. And so at this, when you're doing this, you know, special assignment, at this point, you're so much nearer to where the action is in Vietnam. And had you heard of SOG or something that was drifting around? Because I have been told by others that there was whispers of something going on. I didn't I didn't hear about SOG uh, for a long time, but the team that I was on, uh, all of them were Vietnam veterans, and most of them had run recon and Project Delta. Right. That's kind of knew each other, and that's how they all got handpicked to this team. But Guys like Bill Spencer and Leo Kelland and uh, Lee Wade, uh, uh, Mike Belcher, all those guys had run recon in Vietnam in Project Delta. So I was around all that talk for two years. And when we went to the field, I, I was learning from these guys. because uh, I mean, the, the, they were my mentors, you know. And uh, so Bill Spencer left... Thailand about two, three months before I did. And he wrote me a letter and he said, Bill, he said, if you want to run recon when you get to Vietnam, he said, come to Mac V Sog. He said, I got a slot for you on my team up here. And that was the first I ever heard about Mac V Sog. And uh, so uh, you know, it's always better when you're going somewhere new to go and work for somebody you know. So I said, that's what I want to do. I'm going to go there. And, and uh, but that was the first I'd heard of SOG. So even though, I mean, I'm not saying that the men that you just mentioned were talking about SOG. So, but were there some men who were openly talking about stuff that they had done in this special unit? And they they just said, I can't tell you any more about it. Like, was there was it was it not talked about at all? Well, I I, I didn't know anybody at that time that right. had been in. Sog was you know relatively new, uh, and and uh, like I say, all, all the guys that I worked with had been in Project Delta, which was an in country uh, recon mm -hmm. unit. Uh, so I I didn't really uh, talk to anybody or knew anybody that was in SOG until I got that letter from Bill Spencer and and he had ended up in SOG. So then it, it then uh, so I'm looking at your at your bio here and it said you spent two years in Thailand, um, and now when I talked to you off camera last Sunday, I, I that is where you had the encounter with the snake, is that right? It is. Okay, so that I, I think that's a cool story because I know that I myself find that interesting. It's not just the enemy that could kill you. So would you mind telling uh, the, the people, the folks about that? Okay. Well, we were we were out on a uh, field training exercise with a uh, platoon of uh, uh, little people. And... Uh, uh, so, in fact, Bill Spencer and I uh, had set up a perimeter with this platoon, and and he and I were in the in the middle of the perimeter, and uh, we had laid a poncho down on the ground as a ground sheet, and just laid down on top of the poncho. You didn't need to cover up; it was plenty warm, and just kind of leaned back on our rucksacks, and you know, we're sleeping, and uh, you know, we, we the little people were on security and all that stuff. And so sometime in the night, I felt something crawling under that poncho. And I thought, oh, my God, there's a snake under this poncho, you know. And so I woke up Bill. I said, hey, there's a snake under this poncho. And he said, okay. He said, I'm going to count three. He said, on three, 
roll to the outside and uh, we'll get off this thing and see what's there. And I said, Geez, okay. So we kind of one, two, three, and we rolled off and got out the red filter flashlight and picked up the poncho. And there was a snake under there. It's called a banded crate, one of the deadliest snakes uh, in the world. So we, we immediately killed it. But the, uh, the story goes, banded crates always travel in pairs. So we were totally convinced that somewhere close by was another one of these characters. <laughs> and uh, of course, we couldn't you know, turn on flashlights and get everybody out looking for it. I mean, we're tactical, right? And, and uh, so him and I sit, spent the rest of the night sitting on top of our rucksacks, <laughs> that red filter flashlight, looking I for this yeah. buddy. I can't, I can't imagine that. I mean, I don't know how you would sleep after that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. I know that I really enjoyed it. And so uh, it says here, spent two years in Thailand um, w with the certain agency, worked with a great bunch of Vietnam vets, several from Project Delta, then summer 69 re-enlisted for Vietnam. And so this is a story I know that you wanted to tell the public about, which is pretty wild. It it's, uh, you know, in, in uh, today's military, it would be unheard of to do something like this. But back in the day, uh, it was not as bizarre as it, would, as it sounds today. But what happened, I, I had a chance to go to scuba school in, uh, in Thailand there at the end of my tour. And, and, uh, the SF-46 company was running a scuba school for the Thai Marine Force Recon people. And they allowed two Americans to go through the course with the Thais. And I had a chance to go through that. And so I talked to my team star and I said, look, when I finish scuba school, I'm up for re-enlistment. I'm re-enlisting for NOM. Can I just go into Bangkok and take care of all that? And go, and he said, yeah, you've, you, you've done a good job here. Go ahead. So I finished scuba school, packed up the stuff, and went to Bangkok. And I spent a couple of days there and got everything lined up. And uh, I re-enlisted uh, at a place called Bill Book's Cellar Bar. It was a bar owned by an ex-Navy SEAL that was really off the beaten track. Nobody knew about it except the guys in country there. Wow. And it, was a, it was a watering hole for SF guys. So anyway, I re-enlisted there. That's another story I'll have to tell you offline someday. But anyway... Uh, in Bangkok, the 46th company had a team house and they had a full-time NCO at that team house. And so anybody from anywhere in Thailand who went into Bangkok had to go to the team house and sign in and put down where they were staying and all that. Uh, and then they had to sign out of the team house when you left to go back to your camp, wherever it was. And, and so a lot of the administrative stuff went through the team house. So after I re-enlisted, uh, I went over there. There was a, a sergeant first class named Buzz Keenholz that was running the team house. And so my orders would be sent to him since I was in Bangkok. And so uh, first thing I did uh, when I re-enlisted, I, I got $2,800 re-enlistment bonus. Wow. And they took about four or $500 out in taxes. And somebody told me, said, if you'll fly to Hong Kong, you'll fly over Vietnam and you can get that month uh, pay tax free and you can get that money back. So I said, I'll do that. So when I bought a ticket and uh, flew to Hong Kong, spent three days in Hong Kong, uh, bought a, a briefcase full of Rolexes for all the guys that ordered one. And, uh, Flew back, and so I got my tax money back because that month was tax-free. <laughs> so I thought my orders would be there when I got back from Hong Kong, you know, but no orders. And 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 so over the next, you know, few days, I was going out every night and partying like crazy because I'm going to Vietnam tomorrow. I mean, that was my mindset, you know. And, and I'd go into the team house every day and – Buzz would say, yeah, I got no orders. They hadn't come in. They hadn't come in. And this went on for 30 days. Wow. I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, 
you know, uh, real estate for NOM and I can't get orders. Are you kidding me? But uh, by this time, I was a physical wreck because I'd been partying hard in Bangkok for 30 days and I'd spent my entire reenlistment bonus. Oh, I'm sure you had fun though. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and so I went in there and uh, I said, Buzz, you got any orders for me? He said, No, man, they did not come in. I said, Look, I'm going to Vietnam. He said, you can't go to Vietnam without orders. I said, I'm going to Vietnam. And and I got me in a taxi. I went out to Don Moong Airport, went up to the counter and bought a commercial ticket from Bangkok to Saigon. It cost me 30 bucks. And I, I had everything I owned in a kit bag, got on the plane and flew to Saigon. I landed on the civilian side and I walked over to the military side and there was a bunch of helicopters lined up there. And, uh, you know, all the choppers were sitting there, but the crew chiefs were out around the choppers. They always stayed with the chopper. And uh, so I walked down this line of helicopters, and I finally found one that was on the way to the train. I said, can I get a ride? Yeah, sure. You know, they didn't care in Vietnam. So I got on this chopper and flew to the train to the fifth group headquarters. And uh, I <laughs> I went up to the staff duty and said, it was like seven o'clock at night by this time. And I said, I need to sign in. And he said, okay. He said, uh, I need a copy of your orders. I said, well, there's a problem. I said, I, I actually have lost my orders. And he said, man, he said, you can't sign in without orders. And he said, you're going to have to see the Sergeant Major in the morning. And I said, okay. So at an NCO club there, and I, I went over to the club to get something to eat. And I run into a guy named Don Milligan that I'd been in training group with. And I went over to see him and I said, you know, we were talking. I said, well, where are you working? He said, I'm at FOB2. I said, I said, uh, you up there with Bill Spencer? He said, yeah. I said, uh, when are you going back? He said, tomorrow morning, seven o'clock. I said, how are you getting there? He said, I'm gonna fly on a Blackbird. I said, can I get on that aircraft? He said, yeah. So <laughs> I got the next, got on this Blackbird and uh, flew to Contum, and we landed at the airstrip, got on the deuce and a half, and, and uh, went up to the FOB and uh, pulled up in front of Recon Company Orderly Room, and uh, I got off the truck, and, and uh, well, first I had had, uh, had to go over to the dispensary and, and, and help Bill Spencer. I saw him over there. We unloaded some body bags. That's another story. But uh, so I, I went into the orderly room to sign in. And uh, First Sergeant Doney was the recon company, First Sergeant at that time. And I told him, I see, I need to sign in. And same deal. He said, Where's your orders? And I don't have any. And uh, he said, Man, you can't be here without orders. And I said, Well, he said, Stay right there. He said, I'm going to call the, the sword major and see what to do. So he called the <laughs> group sword major on radio. And and he said, I got this guy up here with no orders, wants to run recon, FOB2. And and uh, the sword major said, you keep that dumb son of a bitch up there with you. Don't send him back to me. So <laughs> I was there in recon company with no orders. Uh, but he went in and signed me to a team, and uh, my orders actually caught up with me in about two weeks, so I was legit after that. But uh, so that was back to that Master Soren Heinzman telling me, you know, you can do it if you go after it. And I wanted to go to FOB too because that's where Bill Spencer was, and I wanted to be on his team. And and uh, so that's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so at this at this point you're not um you're not a cherry to uh to to uh combat you've probably you know the in the 46 and we, we don't have to go down that path but you're not walking into sog without some uh, combat experience absolutely it, it was right. a real day to spend those two years in thailand with the people that i was able to uh when I was very comfortable in the woods, uh, you know, in a tactical situation. Uh, and, and so unlike most of the guys in SOG who were 19, 20, 21 years old, 
they had never done anything like this when they first got there. And and uh, all they had the benefit of was some some training, uh, going through the SF training group. So I was I was way ahead of the game there in terms of comfort level uh, compared to most other guys. Yeah. And so in your bio, we're moving now to initially assigned to RT uh, Minnesota, but immediately deployed as a strat hanger with Joe Messier, uh, Messer, sorry, uh, R2 California. So that was your first mission. Then you stayed on the grounds for 11 days. And that's when you got your, your, uh, you know, immersed in foot that we talked about. Yeah, it, uh, it was interesting. There was, it was monsoon season and, and the weather was horrible. And, uh, so there was two teams that were going to insert and they had side by side, no bomb lines, their targets were side by side. So it was determined that, uh, that it would be best if they had a hole in the clouds that both teams would insert together on the same LZ, uh, because you, it's, was highly unlikely you're going to find two open LZs in that weather. Look, if you found one and then they would split once they got on the ground and go into their separate AOs. And, and, uh, so, uh, it was the Northern target. And so our launch site we were using was at Doc Peck, which was a special forces, a camp, but we had a little launch site up there down by the, the airstrip, just a GP medium tent. And, uh, we went from FOV2 up to launch site every day uh, for about 10 days, I guess it was, before Covey was able to call and, and tell us we could play ball. Uh, that's how bad the weather was. Uh, while, we, while we were doing that, uh, interestingly, every day there was a routine. Uh, our assets came out of play coup, which was a little bit south of Contum. And so on an average morning, the uh, the Cobras would leave play coup and fly directly up to Doc Peck. And they would kind of clear the area and then land up there. While the slicks would come from play coup to Contum, pick us up, and then fly up to Doc Peck. So normally, by the time we got to the launch site, it had already been secured and cleared and everything. And we sat down, everything was good. But there was one day that for some reason, and I don't know what the reason was, but for some reason, the uh, Cobras did not fly up as they normally did. They they didn't fly on time. And so the Slicks came, picked us up, and we flew up, and we landed without any gunships in the area. And, uh, of course, all the recon teams, we got off the choppers and went over to the launch site. And we were just hanging out there. And uh, uh, the pilots had all come into the launch site and they were getting, you know, their briefings, daily briefings and stuff. And uh, all of a sudden you heard a mortar shoot, probably a 60 millimeter mortar. You hear, boom, you know, off on the ridge line. And, and uh, so the, the first round hit right beside uh, one of the choppers and uh, injured the door gunner who was out there fooling around. And so everybody, you know, <laughs> heads up, <laughs> we're taking incoming, you know. And the pilots were running uh, to get out there and get them choppers cranked up and get them off the ground. Well, uh, Charlie was very patient. He just sat there and the first chopper, the guy got it cranked and it was just getting the rotor blade turning good. Not enough to take off yet. And the uh, second mortar round hit that chopper right on top of the, the uh, rotor blade. Oh, man. Yeah. And, of course, the whole engine went sideways and the rotor blades hit the ground. And, and uh, I, I'm i not sure, but I believe that both the pilot and the co-pilot were killed in that. I, I, I can't be really sure. But uh, over the next few minutes, uh, Charlie dropped nine mortar rounds in there. And I think there was, uh, uh, I don't know, there was three or four of the air crew that were killed, and there were several of them that were wounded. And most of the choppers, two of them were totally destroyed, and the other ones had, you know, some frag wounds and stuff, but they were able to get off the ground and fly. And then the Krovers showed up, 
And uh, but by that time, the uh, A team up on the hill had you know triangulated and figured out where this mortar was at. And they were already firing, you know, eighty-one millimeter mortars and stuff out there. And, and uh, so Charlie probably picked up his stuff and left, you know. But that was the that was before we even got on the ground. So that was <laughs> how that mission started. But we inserted finally. And and uh, as soon as we inserted, the clouds closed in. Now, I mean, we were in the clouds, top of the mountains out there, and it was just soaking wet. It never stopped raining. And uh, so the next day, uh, we weren't close to either one of our, our no bomb lines, so we started moving. And uh, one of the yards fell and, and uh, down the side of the little cliff like place and, and uh sprained his ankle really bad <clears throat> and he took his boot off and then of course he did when he did his, his legs swelled all up so it, that kind of slowed things down and we were trying to be really really careful because we knew if we made contact we were dead men there's no no extraction in that kind of weather and so we moved on to a new uh ro insight ro insight and then uh the next day, uh, Joe Messer was was the team leader of one of the teams, and Gross was the team leader of the other team. And they decided that they that we would all just stick together, that we wouldn't even try to split, because it was obvious we weren't going to be able to do any kind of a mission, not not in that conditions. And so, we found an LZ, we moved to the LZ and, and uh, moved off of it a ways and set up a perimeter and we just hunkered down and we stayed right there. We didn't move anymore because we had called for an extraction and, and uh, you know, the deal was we had to wait till there was a hole in the clouds before they could, could come and pick us up. Well, we stayed uh, 11 days it's kind of interesting because, you know, in those days, you normally planned for a five-day operation. And most of us, on day one, just took a can of fruit or, or something like that. And then you took three meals for the next three days. And then, you know, a light something for the fifth day because you were going to come out. So we didn't have a lot of food. And uh, <laughs> we tried to... Uh, you know, be conservative, but we still ran out of food. And uh, it got pretty hungry before we got out. But uh, finally, on the 11th day, they were able to get a uh, Jolly Green Giant, CH-53, from uh, up in Dedane that flew out there. And he had the equipment that he could hone in on. We had a mini ponder, uh, and he was able to hone in on that mini ponder and come in and pick us up and get us out of there. You know, this one uh, one thing that, uh, again, that I'm sure the public don't realize is that uh, when you were when you were on stand down and then you and then you're you, then you're not going to go, then you're all, and, th and then you're told, yes, you are going. I mean, your adrenaline is going up and down. OK. And your frustration, you got all your gear on. And when you have those adrenaline dumps, when you after that course is through your body, you're going to get quite tired, like later on in the day, right? It's like the fight or flight kicks in. So that must have been extremely frustrating to be, you know, let's just go. I just, just want to go and, and do my mission, right? Exactly. Yeah, that, that uh, going to and from the launch site for 10 days, you know, it, it, it was kind of like partying in Bangkok thinking you're going to Vietnam the next day. It was the same deal. You go to bed at night thinking, okay, tomorrow I'm going to insert, you know, and then you don't. And so the next night you go through the same process. So it, it works on your mind. It does. Now, at this, at this point, like when we're talking about this being up and then, and then down as it were for your, for your intensity level or getting ready to go, how are you able to sleep? Like, how are you able, if your mind, you've just had your mind, you're all focused, you're going on this mission, your buddies checked your your all your gears, whatever, all that kind of stuff. Then how do you when you're hit when you're I mean, do you have a couple of beers like or or how do you get ready to sleep? Yeah, multiple beers. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way you could do it. Uh, because if you just laid down, 
you know, that's all you can think about is, you know, and, and, uh, I used to have this premonition that when I lay down on my bunk at night, I had this vision of a mortar round coming through the roof and hitting me right in the nose. I had that vision, uh, every night, but, uh, uh, you know, you drink a few beers and, and you get sleepy enough, you can go to sleep. But if you just tried to lay down, uh, you'd probably be laying there for hours before you go to sleep. Because it, it does. It works on your mind. And now I'm sure that with that in mind, whenever you have drinks, you know, it's pretty, some people, it's hard to say, okay, I'm just going to have two tonight. I'm sure a lot of guys went on missions and they were, and they were hung over. And then you're not, you're not on your game, right? I mean, there must have been another personal not you but a personal like okay i got to get my shit together here this is life or death and it doesn't matter i feel like crap right yeah but the adrenaline kicks in and and uh, your senses get rolling uh so that that wasn't a big factor but you know we were all young and dumb in those yeah. days drank quite a bit of beer and still get up and do pt the next morning or whatever so uh didn't require a lot of sleep uh so it, the good so old day, but <laughs> and so now one one thing that is said i mean quite often is talked about is signing this uh you know your 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 nda you know not non-disclosure did you ever with your different kind of uh way that you got to sog did you ever have to sign a document stating that you wouldn't I never did because I did in process in the train and that's where most of them had to sign this, uh, NDA. Uh, and I was never asked to at FOB two. I understand some people were, uh, I just, me and myself, I was never asked to sign one. And it may have been that, that I came from Thailand and didn't go through the normal in process. See, in those days, there was a place called camp alpha. And everybody coming to Vietnam went to Camp Alpha first, and they in process into Vietnam there. And then from there, they went to 5th Group headquarters in the train and in process there. And some of the guys had told me uh, when I re-enlisted in Thailand, they said, don't even go to Camp Alpha because they're stealing SF soldiers there and sent them to the Big Red One, the 173rd, 1st Cav wherever because they want those experienced NCOs in leadership position. And so I, I just totally bypassed Camp Alpha. Uh, I, I was just just as illegal as I could be all the way up. Uh, I'm just glad that the first sergeant let me stay there and go to work. So I'm looking at the time and we have an, another 20 minutes. Um, uh on this the first one i think because i do want to i do want to tell the public about your full story it's i mean there's so many different aspects and i don't want to miss anything so can we just talk a little bit about um your your feet or your foot your you know because i didn't even though i've read many books before uh about military conflicts over the years immersion foot was not something that i was familiar with and you explained that to me and i don't think people realize how serious that that can be yeah uh on that operation the 11 day operation uh it was very cold and very wet and we were totally immobilized we we lay on the ground and in fact, I remember rolling up in a ground sheet. I, I didn't have a poncho because I didn't think it got so cold. I just had a piece of plastic, that, a ground sheet. And and uh, it was so cold that you roll up and the water would run inside of it. And then you didn't want to move because your body would warm that water up a little bit. And, wow. and But if you moved, fresh cold water would run in, you know. So <laughs> we literally just stayed there totally immobilized during that whole time. And and uh, so we're, we're soaking wet. There was no such thing as putting on dry socks because there weren't any. Uh, and and uh, so immersion foot is, is literally one step below frostbite. It's when your feet have been 
very cold and very wet for an extended period of time. And so when we, when we were extracted and came back, we could, we could barely walk. Uh, my toes were all black, literally turned black. Uh, there was, uh, let's see, three, four, five. There were, I think, six Americans on that operation. Three of them got medevaced with immersion foot, and three of us uh, did not. And the three that did not, all three of us had just got in country and, and were still in pretty good physical shape. But we sat around for the next three weeks with our feet elevated, trying to get the circulation back in our toes. And fortunately, it did come back. Uh, or I guess we would have lost those toes <clears throat> because they were pretty bad shape. Now you so did it, about a month or so. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, now you told me that you know fifty plus years later that the damage to your nerves and to your feet still affects you. It does. I. I actually draw uh, some VA disability on my feet for that reason. But yeah, I, uh, I struggle uh, if I have to walk on concrete for, you know, more than 15, 20 minutes, they really start bothering me or, or standing. Uh, I, I remember a few years back, uh, took some grandkids down to Disney and uh, standing in those lines at those right. rides was just excruciating. I actually went and rented one of them little scooters uh, to drive around in because I just could not stand like that. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I do have uh, effects of it now. It didn't really bother me uh, during the rest of my military career. Right. Uh, but but the older I get, the more it bothers me. So. And so from when you went, uh, now, did you have to go home for that? Did you go stateside when you had no, your... I stayed right there at FOB2. Okay. Yeah. So then it says here, uh, after you got better, which was roughly three weeks, you went with Ray Harris um, as a 1-1 one -one on a bright light. And you were, which is a good story here, you were actually, um, the re uh, you ran a su successful rescue mission and you actually got the gunner out, the door gunner out. Yeah. I've heard so many, you know, sad stories, you know, so maybe on this last 15 minutes, you can just cover that. Well, we, uh, when we were uh, cleared uh, for duty again, uh, I was still assigned to RT Minnesota. Ray Harris was the uh, one zero and Donald Green, uh, who went with me on the 11 day operation, he was the one two. And so we drew uh, uh, the, the card for <laughs> going on bright light during Christmas. And, and so we went up to Docto and we were up there waiting and, and, uh, uh, so this one day we went up, I don't remember the exact date, but that morning we went up there and uh, there was a team getting ready to insert. There were a couple of teams on the ground already. And so that team left and I, I, I just don't remember what team it was because the bright light team stayed separate from the other operation. We didn't want to get in the way. We we're over doing some training on our own because nothing else to do. So anyway, uh, after a while, we got a message back that that team had been shot off the LZ and uh, that they were returning back to FOB2 direct. So we were sitting there and, and uh, not long after that, got a radio message from Covey that one of the teams on the ground up north had just declared a prairie fire emergency. So all the Cobras, everything took off. And so there was nothing at the airstrip at Doc Toe except bright light team in the launch side just sitting there. And this helicopter landed and uh, uh, they shut it down and the, you know, the, the, the crew chief got out there and started pumping gas down at, you know, the bladders and uh, topping it off and everything. And the pilot came running over to where we were at and he said, uh, are you guys the bright light team? We said, yeah. He said, uh, he said, I got a really special request that uh, you may not want to do. He said, what happened? He said, well, the, the team that got shot off, that LZ, 
He said one of the chase licks took a B-40 round in the tail boom and went in. And he said uh, uh, he was the other chase slick. And, and he said they were, uh, you know, spinning and, and crashed through the canopy. And he said they circled around and they could see people. So they dropped McGuire rigs and said three people got into the McGuire rigs. And they started up through the trees and one guy fell out of the McGuire rig. But they headed on back uh, with the other two. And he said about halfway back, uh, while they were still in Laos, uh, another guy fell out of the McGuire rig at about 3,000 feet. And awesome. so he just went all the way in. And uh, so they were able to get one guy, the pilot is who they actually uh, got back. The, the co-pilot had, was the one that fell out of the McGuire rig. But when they, when they had dropped the McGuire rig, these, these aviators, instead of sitting in the slings of the McGuire rig, they did it like the Navy does on a water rescue. They they put the loop behind their back and under their arms and, and, nice. and trying to hang on like that. Well, coming up out of the canopy, they drug them through the top of the canopy and that knocked the door gunner loose. So he fell, I don't know, 60, 70 feet. And, and uh, the co-pilot had a broken arm and so he couldn't hang on and that's how he slipped out and fail but anyway they got the other pilot uh out so he asked us he said we believe that the door gunner might still be alive and there's another door gunner out there we never did see him on the ground but he may be in that area where the chopper crashed he may have got slung out as he was crashing we don't know will you go with us and try to get this guy out and we said yeah <clears throat> so he said well, I can only take two people uh, because uh, of the altitude and all, whatever, weight. And, and, and uh, so we said, okay, so Ray and I grabbed our gear and got on the chopper and we took off. And it was, uh, it was way out. It was like a 45 minute flight out there. And <laughs> so all the way I'm thinking, you know, we're in a helicopter. We're flying out to a downed aircraft that's got shot down, well, probably an hour and a half ago by this time. It's got to be crawling with NVA. NVA must be there. They shot the dead gum helicopter down, you know. And I, this has got to be the either the most courageous thing you've ever done or the dumbest thing you've ever done to go out here and, and, and uh, try to do this. But uh, just before we got there, uh, we knew we had to rappel in. So the, they were getting the, the, you know, the, the rucksacks with the rappelling rope in them, how we had them rigged. They're getting ready. And, I, and at that point, I realized I didn't have any rappelling gloves. They were back. at. So I told the crew chief and he gave me his flight gloves, which you probably know are not very thick. <laughs> So anyway, I put on the flight gloves instead of repelling gloves. And, and uh, we got on station. They went over and they hovered over. There was just a hole in the canopy where the chopper had crashed through. And uh, the chopper was still burning at that time. And and uh, so Ray went out one side. I went out the other side. We're on the skids. And, okay, let's go. And we both went off. And uh, Ray was Ray had the radio. And so he was traveling a lot faster than I was. And and uh, so I looked down and I see Ray, he's, he's hanging upside down. He's got this big water rope uh, in his snap link because you couldn't shake your ropes and get them clear all the way to the ground because there was brush and trees and stuff down there. It was not just a clear LZ, you understand? So anyway, I went down and, uh, to the same level he was at and I, I braked and you know, wrapped around, I was holding on and I was swinging over uh, and I had my knife out and I was going to cut his rope uh, so the chopper could take off and we, you know, going down, whatever. And the door gunner saw what I was trying to do, which I couldn't get to him. And so the door gunner cut his rope in the chopper 
Ray went sliding down the tree. Radio hit him in the back of the head, kind of knocked him out for a couple of minutes. I was able to get onto the ground my, without a tangled up rope. I was very fortunate. About the time I got on the ground, it got unhooked. Ray was up and moving. But anyway, uh, we looked around. Rounds were cooking off in the chopper, so it was kind of unsettling. We didn't know if we were being shot at or what, you know. And we were fully expecting to be shot at. In fact, I was expecting to be shot at when we were on the skids, but nobody shot. And I looked around, and I saw this guy. He's over in a big clump of bamboo, and he's he just kind of hunched over, but he's sitting there. And, and I went over to him. And he did not even know we were there until I got right in his face. And uh, his bottom teeth were sticking through his lip. He had a broken arm. And he said he thought his back was broken. And it, this was a big guy, probably weighed 220, 230, something like that, uh, door gunner. And we had to move him about 30 feet over to where we could drop the rigs to extract him. And I told him, I said, partner, we got to move. He said, I can't move. I said, okay. So I got two syrettes of morphine and shot him in his leg. And he got up and we moved him over, uh, called for the chopper to come back. And he, they dropped the rigs. We, Ray and I tied him in. And then we got in ours and we extracted. And the chopper flew for about probably... 10 minutes, 15, I don't know. And it was a big cleared area. And he sat down in that cleared area. And uh, we hoisted him into the chopper. You know, it took all of us to get him in there. And we got in the chopper and then flew on back to launch site. And then they took off and uh, medevaced him down to play coup to the hospital. And interestingly enough, uh, Don Green, who was there with us on the bright light, uh, ended up getting medevaced on New Year's New Year's Eve, he fell and, and uh, broke his leg in a hole there and and uh, uh, ended up in the same room in Japan uh, at the hospital with this guy. Wow. So we got the feedback that he did make it OK and and was all right. So it was uh, it was a good deal. But we came back to launch site and, and uh, you know, pretty excited that we survived that with no contact. I mean. How do you have a helicopter shot down and on the ground an hour and a half, two hours, and, and no NVA? Or, I mean, that's a that's a NVA magnet yeah. uh, aircraft is. But anyway, so we're sitting around there, and uh, we got a message from the S three said uh, we need you to go back out there and look for that fourth guy oh. that may on out. And I thought, you got to be kidding me. So this time we convinced the uh, the pilot, we got to take more than two people. So we took four, uh, me, Ray, Don Green, and one of the yards. And we flew back out there, repelled in again. And uh, by this time, the, the chopper was not burning anymore. It burned out. It's just a big old pile of rubble. We went, went over and went through all the rubble to see if there was a body. We couldn't find anything that resembled a body. So we, we just kind of got online and, and made a big sweep, about a 200-yard sweep uh, looking. And But, you know, we had no idea uh, where this plane got hit, how far away it was from where it crashed. We don't know if the guy got knocked out of the plane when the B-40 hit the plane. We don't know if, if he fell out when it was spinning a half mile away. We didn't have any idea, uh, but, but we, we didn't find him. And uh, by this time it was getting dark. Uh, so knew, we knew if we didn't get out of there by dark, we wouldn't get out. And so we called the chopper back. He came back, picked us up and we flew back to launch site. And did you, so, did you ever find out if, uh, I mean, is that man one of the MIAs still to this day or? Yeah, interestingly, uh, a couple of years ago, Ray and I were contacted by a guy. And I, I have his name and all of his information, but it, I don't have a right. tip of my He was with the, the 
POW agency that was looking for, you know, MIAs. And uh, they had actually uh, uh, honed in on this guy that had failed 3,000 feet from the chopper. And, and they had, uh, you know, a general location of where he was. And they had actually went out and searched that area, but they did not did not find him. So he's still missing in action, as is the other door gunner. Wow. You know, and it's um, before he passed away, I was talking to uh, Mike, Mike uh, Taylor. And, uh, you know, he was deeply involved with the MIAs and that kind of stuff. And he told me, he said, Jason, due to the soil content in Southeast Asia, there's really very little left. Um, yeah. Often people, unless I, unless it's someone like you, a veteran who was there, or for me to talk to families who still have loved ones who are MIA, that you don't realize that that the soil there breaks down bone, cloth, metal, everything. And the only thing that's left is often teeth. So yeah. to find that is really like a, a, a needle in a haystack. So well, actually, uh, the next day, get this. Chief Sog sent a message to FOB2 to send the Bright Light team back out and look for this co-pilot that had fell out. And Major Jax, bless his heart, who was the S3 at FOB2, convinced Saigon that there is no way. We don't even have a clue yeah. within five miles of where he fell out. I mean, we don't even know where to begin searching, you know. So... uh but interestingly enough, the, the guy that did contact us uh, from the, the uh, MIA POW thing, uh, he confirmed that the guy had actually fell out in Cambodia. They were, it was the, the target was along the Cambodia and the ocean border. And I don't know how they confirmed that, but they confirmed that it was in Cambodia where he fell out. So, wow. So, Bill, um, we've reached the hour and a half level, and I don't want to uh, to um, go much further because next time um, I'd like for, for you to tell everybody about, you know, Operation Ashtray. I mean, that's that's an amazing thing, and there's only a few of you guys left who were on there, and I had the uh, opportunity to talk to Ray as well, and hopefully in the future he might do one of these. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, Thank you for your time today, taking the uh, time to talk to us. And um, let's do this again in the very near near future, maybe, you know, in about three or four weeks. Absolutely. Thank you much, Jason. I appreciate you doing this. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay.